The Tao of Self-Confidence, Episode 435. Welcome to the Tao of Self-Confidence, where I share stories of amazing women who have discovered their inner journey to self-confidence. Visit our website at thetaoofselfconfidence.com. Your inner journey to self-confidence awaits. Well, hello, friend. Welcome to the Tao of Self-Confidence, where I share stories of amazing women who have discovered their inner journey to self-confidence. I'm your host today, Sheena Yapchan, and today I have a phenomenal lady on the show today. She is a writer and a TV and radio host, and I'm really excited to have her on and share her story with us today. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce you to Pei Chen. Pei, how are you today? Maybe you can fill in a little bit more about yourself to our listeners. Sure. Yeah, no, doing great. I I guess I do a little bit of everything, mostly in media. And uh, I think most people would probably be familiar with my work in, uh, in television on camera, which I've been doing for, I guess, over 15 years. So I started off as a interstitial host on Omni TV in, um, in Toronto. And that was probably around 2001 or 2002. But before that, I've been working in TV for a couple of years. So I, my background was in production. So in research and writing, so I used to work in kids TV as well, but uh, people don't usually stop to recognize writers on the street. Um, and then I did a couple of kid shows as well on air and a little bit of acting, some radio. And now I go on usually as like a lifestyle expert or guest or food experts for different daytime shows. So it's kind of spans a couple of almost two decades now and has changed a little bit over those years. But that's sort of the essence of what I do. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. And Pei, what's your cultural background? Uh, I was born in Taiwan, but my parents moved to Nova Scotia when I was about a year old. So I grew up on the East Coast. Thanks for sharing that. And what would be your favorite self-confidence quote? You know, I think it's probably changed. I went through a period where I didn't know if I was cut out for TV. And I think there was a period where I was like, I always had anxiety. And I was like, okay, you can, you can do this, you'll be fine. And I kept repeating that over and over again. And I and I also started saying a lot, this will end as in like the, the anxiety and the panic part will end and you'll kind of come out at the end of it. So sort of the easiest thing for me to do was just to keep repeating like, you'll be fine you'll be fine. And, you know, I I survived without any huge problems. Thanks for sharing that. I think that's something we all go through, right? Especially if we want to do something that we we love. And, you know, growing up as an Asian woman, it's like we've been told to do one thing, but there's another path that you want to take. And it's it's scary because we don't know what's going to happen. But just taking that leap of faith really just propels you to keep going. So I really love that quote. And, you know, just it is a great reminder saying you'll be fine. It's not like the end of the world. So thanks for sharing that. And in your own words, how do you define self-confidence? I think probably my definition has changed over the years. I'd say now I would define it as being really sure of what you're able to do. And that doesn't mean that you can't want to do other things. I think that's also something that's great to have, but being quite sure that you're capable and not being afraid to say no. I think that's something that comes with experience and with with confidence is knowing when something doesn't feel right and not being afraid to speak up. I think as women and sometimes women of a certain cultural background and upbringing, perhaps, we are often told to, you know, not rock the boat, perhaps not to make things awkward, you know, not to express displeasure or be rude, because that could be seen as being rude. And what that does is I think it puts you into a position where you sometimes you do things you don't really want to do, or you do things where you know you're not feeling valued. So it takes a while before you come to a point where you're like, no, I'm not afraid to say that this is not okay. Or I'm, you know, I'm not afraid to verbalize what it is that I want. And I think when you're at a position where you're not afraid to say these things that might make someone feel a bit awkward, or or perhaps are taken aback, uh, I think that's a really great display of confidence. Thanks for sharing that. And, you know, I love what you mentioned, especially learning to say no, because we're so, um, as women, like we just say yes to everything just to please others, not realizing that could hurt us in the end. So thanks for sharing that. And Pei, what was your life like before your discovery of self-confidence? You know, I don't think it was a, a, like hugely different. I think uh, media is a very tough industry. I think uh, in most industries, women, you know, we're, we usually make less than men. We're sometimes treated differently and not in the, in the best way. And media being on camera is not always the kindest to people in general, men or women, but I think it's especially harsh on women. So you kind of just 
go through things that you just think are life experiences. And so I would say, you know, in my 20s, when I got had my you know first on your job, and I was working different shows doing production, you're just learning along the way, you're not everything feels right, or you don't love everything that you do. But I think that's also something you need to do in your 20s is to figure out uh, knowing what you don't want to do is I think just as positive and productive as knowing what you don't want to do. So sometimes you have to do something you don't like to really know like, okay, this is this is not you know, not for me. But I had for almost 10 years, the luxury of being like a full time employee, I was a salaried employee with you no know, Rogers. And with that comes a lot of there's a lot of benefits to that. You know, there's filters, there's people that filter things for you. There's always someone who, you know, helps you with different things. So you know, I, you have a team, in essence, and you're kind of just going with emotions. This is how things are done. So you do it. Uh, and then I would say that when I decided to freelance and go on my own, that was sort of more of that learning curve where I thought, oh, no, this is where I have to start learning to put my foot down. Thanks for sharing that. And, you know, what was that moment in your life when you realized, like, you know, you can go out there and be, you know, doing freelance work, just going out there and being on your own? Like, what was that aha moment? I don't know that there was like one moment. I think when I, I, I quit my job because I, I wanted to move back to Toronto and I just felt a little bit burnt out and I had wanted to travel for a bit and kept saying I would do it, never did. So it was sort of, you know, a perfect storm in terms of leaving where I was, putting my stuff into storage and then traveling for a couple of months. And then when I moved back, I'd been out of the city for two years and then I just really had to hustle. I realized that people didn't know I was back. People associated me strongly with the station where I was working at. So they just assumed I was working there again. So, you know, people didn't know I was for hire, really. And you start to, it's a little bit humbling to go, okay, I got, I have to take a few steps back and reevaluate how I'm going to go about doing this. How am I going to pay my bills? And you go through a few situations where you go, well, no, this is, this is how much I think I should be getting for this. And then people are like, no, this is what we've got, you know, X dollars. And you have to decide what your time is worth. And I think that that's something I'm still doing, but that was a really um, valuable task, I would say, especially that first year is there's a balance between, you know, taking work because you need to work and you want to work and you want that variety and knowing when to say, this is actually not worth my time to do. Therefore, I do I say no and pass it up? Do I move? Do I and then, you know, not get paid because I said no to this project and look for something that's a little bit better. And I think you have to do a little bit of both. Um, I think it's really easy to be afraid to say no, because you don't want to pass up work. But you know, it took a little while for for me to realize no, I think I know what I'm doing well enough that I can say this is this is what it will cost for this project that you want to do. And I got a lot better at that. And I realized that a lot of people, they just, they were fine with it. It's just that if you didn't ask, you wouldn't know. Thanks for sharing that. You know, it's great that you're able to, you know, decide if something is in alignment with you or not, because a lot of people, you know, they just take jobs for the money, right? And sometimes they feel like if they pass up on the opportunity, it's gone forever. But sometimes saying no could be a good thing because something better might come along. And yeah, that takes work to realize, especially learning to trust your own intuition, thinking if you made the right decision. But, you know, because of those realizations, what's your life been like now? I would say, you know, it's funny because I think online people, you have a very manicured, curated life. So, you know, people think like, oh, it's so great. You travel and you eat and you have this luxurious lifestyle. I'm like, well, yes and no. You know, I do lead a bit of a charmed life. I'm very fortunate to have flexibility in my work schedule that allows me to travel, which, you know, when I was a full-time salaried employee, you know, you, you kind of count your vacation days because they're so valuable. At the same time, I don't get vacation pay. I don't have health benefits. There's pros and cons. But now I, I can make my own schedule a little bit if I decide that I want to visit family on the East Coast or on the West Coast for a week, I can kind of do that, you know, and I realize that there's the possibility of missing out on some work, which does happen, but you kind of can't be held prisoner to being afraid to miss out on a paycheck and not enjoy life at the same time. So now it's not like I just sit back and you know, money rolls in, but I have, I think, enough of a background and a reputation that certain clients or brands or people know that I can deliver. And that's a good feeling to have, but that also means working really hard with each one. You can never be so confident that you just think, oh, it's enough that I'm doing this. You still have to make sure that 
you deliver beyond expectations so that you maintain that reputation and that you can maintain whatever you're charging people. Like if you're going to charge people for a project, you want them to feel like they got their money's worth at the same time. So I've been able to achieve more of that work life balance, I guess, if you want to call it by allowing myself to take some time off to enjoy things. And I do say no to projects, but sometimes I say yes to projects that I'm not particularly passionate about. And that's because I'm self-employed and I, I can look ahead to the next few months and think, well, I don't know that I've got a whole lot going on the next few months. I can do this project. I may not be in love with it, but you have to make those concessions sometime because you know, unless you're independently wealthy, you'll, I don't know that most people can always choose only the things that they want to do. But I think you have to execute everything with the same level of professionalism, whether it's something you really love or something you're like, yeah, this is going to be okay for the next few weeks. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. And, you know, to the woman who's listening to your episode, she may be in her own journey of self-confidence. What'd be that one tip you would give to her? I would say you have to there's going to be risks that you have to take. And I think we are often afraid of failure. I think everyone is naturally. And you just have to prepare. I don't think someone should just jump up and walk into their boss's office and say, I quit because I hate doing this. I want to do something else. I think you really have to plan for it. When I knew that I was, I knew for months that I was going to quit my job. And so I saved up money. I knew I was not going to have a single dollar coming in for months because I was going to travel, which meant only money going out. So I say, but, you know, work ahead, figure out ways. I had to tighten my budget a little bit. Like I was very used to kind of just, if I wanted to go to dinner, I could a few times a week. It was no big deal. You know, I'm single. I don't have kids. I had an um, okay income. And I, you need to plan a little bit so that you can actually go forward and do it. And you have to be aware that you will have setbacks and little failures. There'll be things that disappoint you. There will be promises of exciting projects that will then just dissolve and, and not materialize. And you can really have your heart broken at the very beginning of it because you don't know that this is actually quite normal. And I think what's really important is to realize that with each of these, you need to take a lesson from it. So instead of just being devastated that you didn't get this project or that job or whatever it is, is to figure out like, well, was there something I could have done differently? Could I have planned differently? And I don't mean to that you should blame yourself for it, but that you should definitely just look at every small failure and try to figure out a way where it won't repeat itself. If there was anything that you could have had control in. And also, I think a big thing is you have to really be your number one cheerleader. So when you feel like people are trying to nickel and dime you and take advantage of you, which is kind of their job, everyone's watching the bottom line, is you have to say no. I need, you know, I need this or I need this budget for these expenses or this is part of the project that you did not include in your original outline. And if you want me to do X, Y, and Z, this is what it's going to cost. And you really have to stand up for yourself because no one else is going to do it. So if you don't do it, then you're going to end up working on a project where you have a strip on your shoulder because you feel like you've been taken advantage of or not paid properly. So in doing that, you have to also not be afraid to be disliked. And I think a lot of women, especially, don't, we don't want to make enemies. We don't want, and this goes back to what I was saying in the beginning about, we just want to be nice. And you can be nice, but you can also be really professional. Like I think some of the you know most successful women entrepreneurs or CEOs, you look at them, you can have a lot of respect for them. They are probably people who don't like them, but still respect them. So no one is going to fight for you except for yourself if you're going to you know, make a, a life change. And, uh, and I think people really do ultimately in the end will respect you for being firm and being professional, but that doesn't always mean that doesn't always mean being liked. And at some point you develop a thick enough skin that it doesn't matter to you. Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing those great tips, you know, especially um, like what you mentioned, being afraid not, to, you know, be not to be afraid of being disliked because like, you know, we're always so afraid of what other people think of us. And we're great. Sometimes we're really great people pleasers that we have to just kind of let go of that notion and be okay, because like the right people will come come to us. And if our listeners wanted to get to know a little bit more about you and what you do, is there any links or social media profiles we can connect with? I Yeah, online, like at Pay Chen, P-A-Y-C-H-E-N. Twitter and Instagram is probably what I use most. Um, you can find me on Facebook and online, paychen.com. It's pretty easy. I've managed to get the domain name for almost everything. But I'm there. I'm online and on social media. So that's the quickest. 
Awesome. Well, thanks for sharing that. And to our listeners, if you want to connect with Pei, you can also head on over to thetaoselfconfidence.com and search for Pei's name. Her show notes will pop up along with everything else we talked about. And I just want to thank Pei for taking the time to share her story and tips with us on self-confidence. So thank you so much. You're welcome. Thanks again. And to our listeners, be on the lookout for another new episode of Another Amazing Woman's Journey to Self-Confidence. And we'll talk to you soon. Bye for now. Thank you for tuning in to another amazing episode of The Tao of Self-Confidence. Want to learn how you can use podcasting to market your business? Download your free report by visiting our website at thetowofselfconfidence.com. Your inner journey to self-confidence awaits.